in eastern Paris, a second siege at a kosher supermarket. They arrived like the walking dead. Today is a momentous result for Scotland. Anybody that tells you they, they, they think they know, of course, is, is making it up. A newspaper dropping in your doorway, that's not going to be the natural behaviour anymore. Or perhaps even sitting down and watching TV. The difficulty we have, and maybe one reason we don't sell more copies, is because we try really hard to tell the truth. And the truth is often boring. In the Commons, Mr MacLeod has said that the London busman's pay claim is to go to the industrial court without delay. monopoly on having the ability to take ideas and broadcast in the world is now gone because anyone can, right? Someone with a smartphone in Ferguson can report on a situation just as easily as the BBC. Although the essence of journalism is the same as it ever was, the way that we communicate uh, has changed. I mean, there's been an absolute revolution. And I mean, it is just amazing how many different ways there are to get to people. This is brilliant. This is, you know, this makes my job more exciting and more interesting than ever. Of course you have, you know, those pure players, new media, which are much more agile, uh, don't have big newsrooms, uh, don't have to pay for paper, uh, don't have unions, <laughs> you know, um, so they are faster. We're still in the period of evolution of news and media where we're doing what we call shovelware. We're taking what we used to do and we're replicating it online. And the truth is that newspapers, magazines, news shows, books are all fundamentally still recognizable online in their old forms. News channels brand themselves on breaking the news first and all the rest of it and they don't. Uh, uh, and actually if you want breaking news, if you want in-depth, if you want specialist news, the internet and the web is so much better. Well there's no doubt that breaking news has to happen in, in real time and news organisations have to do that mostly on social media platforms but the rest of the organisation should at that point be marshalling all the context around it, be it the additional reporting, being it the deep reporting, being it the interpretation, being it the profiles, but we need that deep context much faster than we used to. Particularly for younger audiences, the um, theatre and the choreography of television, you know, a man or a woman sitting behind a desk, uh, all the production that goes into the studio, uh, the kind of uh, uh, choreography of handing from the studio to a live position and all of that gets in the way of the story. So many things that we have around us, things like, I don't know, the Eurovision Song Contest, you wouldn't invent that now, but we carry on with it. I don't think you would invent the news now. If we invented the news tomorrow, it would not be a half-hour report at six o'clock. I think we have a problem, I think we have a serious problem, we broadcasters, that is, because if you get on a train in the morning, as everybody knows, on a, the underground or a bus, and you're looking at kids, and they are looking at their tablet or their iPhone. Remind me to take my medicine at 8 o'clock. Speaking as an entire industry, I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we're just at the very basic stages of being able to understand and predict what a user wants at the right time. As new technology, wearables, for example, have not changed our behaviors yet, but it's not unreasonable to imagine that they will. And when they do, we're going to have to apply and adapt to those naturally occurring behaviors rather than try and force them into the behaviors that we are familiar with and comfortable with. The entire industry is implementing or integrating other features to understand its environment. For example, sensors, um, be it physical sensors or sensors that detect motion, for example. And you can divide that into a couple of areas. There's uh, what's called, the, what people refer to the Internet of Things, which, and the cliche there is, well, my refrigerator is going to have a sensor on it. And then there's the, the quantified self, and that's essentially about having wearable sensors 
I take a slightly contrary view about the Internet of Things because the potential for failure is so enormous that you, know, you don't want to be relying on your room to know when you've got into bed to turn the lights off if your Wi-Fi might go down or if actually you're just sitting on the bed to take off your shoes. So it's complicated and this brave new world of a connected everything I think is still some way off. The exciting thing is that there are new tools on the horizon that in, in many ways it's a golden era for journalism, both for reporting and for presentation of our journalism. One thing we like to say is that virtual reality is the last medium. I think in many ways this is the future of news, but not completely. So there's a moment, this aha moment. So with our Hurricane Katrina, you're on the edge of a rooftop and you're sitting there and you're scared and it's raining and the water's coming up and this helicopter comes by and it says, we can't help you and flies away. And that really puts a consumer in the moment and, and puts you inside of the space. This is a server rack, which holds a series of cable boxes, which records television news throughout the day. So everything that we record on the server rack, you can see here on the individual TV screens. There are so many people making content. There's so much information out there. And the internet is basically connecting everybody. So there needs to be some way in order to automatically decide for you or to help filter out all the things that you don't want to watch and help you find what you do want to watch. There's huge opportunities around this, around personalization in general, but it should always be tempered by a certain amount of kind of journalistic gut judgment about, hey, you know what? This may not fit the profile, but it's really damn important, or it's really amazing work. We should put this out there anyway. When you think about data, you just think about like rows and columns, and, and people's eyes just glaze over. That's not very useful. But if we can think about data as a way of telling a story and frame it in the same way and visualize it in the same way so we can look at it chronologically, we can do, we can do a timeline, we can do a timeline that moves, we can do something where we can see the bar charts changing. A local government may have a data set about crime or about their city hall or their budget or uh, sealed court cases and, and it stays local because the local newspaper may do a story just on that. But what I would like to do is figure out a way to take all of those local, disparate local data sets and aggregate them up to find the bigger regional or national or even international trends um, and, and do investigatory journalism with that. We in journalism think that we know what the world needs to know, that we call that news judgment. Well, the truth is I think we have to go to communities and find out what their needs are and find out what they want to accomplish and then and only then can we determine what tools we need to bring to bear to help them meet their needs. And at the end, we should measure our success not on old mass media metrics of thousands of eyeballs that watched our message, but instead on the answer to the question, did journalism help you meet your goals, improve your life, and improve your community? In the world of the click, it's the most provocative headline that wins, and the content doesn't really matter. When you care about what happens after the click, when you care about people's attention, then the only thing that keeps people's attention is great quality content. I think the BBC's trying, I don't know if they're trying enough, to bring people from different backgrounds and different ages into our conversations, into our discussions about how we should do the news and how we should present it, and what are the stories we're going to tell. I don't think it is young audiences' fault that they're not coming to us. I think that we are not using the right tools in order to reach out to them. Porn is the thing people mainly share, so I would, I would focus on that. It's things that people are proud and interested in being talking and talking about in public. That can be like a great joke. It can be serious news. It can be kind of inspiring um, stories about that will make you feel better. It can also be to a fault. It can be here's how you can change the world. The thing is, if you if you're banging on about feminism for 24 hours a day, after a while, there's only a certain amount of people who are going to want to have that. So every so often, you have to throw in a funny picture of a cat. Uh, you know, or, or a picture of an iceberg that looks like Ed Miliband. Uh, people love that stuff. We live in a globalized village. The world has become so close, people are so close to each other because of technology. 
And what has happening, what's happening in one part of the world definitely has got resonance with a different part of the world. I think local news is going to become more important in the future. People want to know what's going on at their local council, at their local hospital, at their local police force, how changes there affect their daily lives. It's human nature, we identify with home. You know, I, so I come from Bradford, right, and I've travelled everywhere. And I found that I always feel a natural pull. Around 40% of people in the world use the web at all. So for the other 60%, in fact, every time the power of the web increases, every time it's possible to do more things online, then actually those 60% are left further behind. It is increasing the, uh, the gap between the, have, uh, the haves and the have-nots. And we know that in the UK there are still 10 million adults who are unable to get the benefits of the web by being able to do four or five things online. And that to me you know, is the, the most fundamental issue that we should be addressing around our connectivity. Britain is beginning to age. It was ageing very slowly before because we had so few babies in the 1930s. Uh, but we had a baby boom after the Second World War and so we're looking at a rising proportion of the population being this old, very elderly, in 10, 20 years' time. Its life expectancy um, across the world has been rising fairly steadily for the last 150 or so years. I don't know if it's just now. I think people have always been interested in, in learning more about their health and their body, but it's only been in the past few years where sensors and technology have gotten to the point where we can create these wearable devices with health sensors that uh, give people this insight. The breaking of news is no longer going to solely be the domain of news organizations. What has to be, though, is that role of journalism. Because in a world where everyone can report on news, <laughs> there is a lot of noise. And the journalist's role is now more important than ever to find the signal in all of that noise and help tell a story with authority and with context that helps all of us understand what the hell is actually going on. The problem of how to distinguish good information from bad, that's the problem that's been with us since we started communicating. So whether it's been books or when you pick up a piece of paper blowing in the street, should you believe what it says on it? The art and science of journalism is really, really important. The art and science of, if you like, uh, of being a custodian of information, of being a librarian, of, of keeping a good set of links on a website, uh, that is still really, really important. Uh, to a certain extent, it could be done by machines, but still the, the energy and hard work of human beings in sifting through all this information is still really, really important.